Hello, my name is Mickey Mackay, and I'm a third year PhD student at Stanford. My research focus is using geostatistical methods to generate stochastic simulations of subglacial topography. In this talk, I'm going to discuss how we can use stochastic simulations of topography to better understand the hydrology beneath Jakobshavn Glacier. Imagine we have some set of possible topographic permutations given some measurement constraint, constraints. You can see that the uncertainties are low in, in some places where there would be a measurement and the uncertainty increases moving away from a measurement. In most ice sheet hydrological analyses, we use topography that looks something like the average of this distribution. But this topography is unrealistically smooth, so it might alter the behavior of our system. And if we only use the average of all the possible solutions, we're not able to quantify the uncertainty of that system with respect to topographic uncertainty. So the question that I address in this project is, what happens when we generate many topographic realizations and apply a simple water routing model to each of them instead of the average? Does this change our interpretation of the hydrological behavior? So let me introduce you to the idea of stochastic simulation. A stochastic simulation is used to generate multiple realizations of a feature while retaining the spatial statistics of observations. The ability of this approach to capture the heterogeneity is an important advantage for many subsurface problems. For example, stochastic simulation is often used in modeling groundwater hydrology because the subsurface heterogeneity has an important control on water flow. This makes it a promising tool for ice sheet applications. We chose a study area at Jakobshavn Glacier in Greenland due to the dense measurement coverage. There are many different ways to implement a stochastic simulation. In this project, I developed a workflow for incorporating mass conservation topography into a simulation. The mass conservation method uses ice surface velocity and flow dynamics to estimate topography such that ice mass is conserved. The topography in the mass conservation uh, interpolation is still smoother than measured topography, but this is valuable information that I wanted to take advantage of. And what I mean is that the simulation should have the same spatial statistics as the radar bed measurements, but it should be correlated to the mass conservation topography. So how exactly does the simulation work? We start by treating each variable the radar and the mass conservation topography, as a Gaussian process. This means that each variable is a normally distributed random process. We performed a normal score transformation to ensure that each variable is standard Gaussian. The simulation is performed one grid cell at a time. So first, we randomly select a grid cell to simulate. Next, we calculate a probability distribution of possible bed elevation values at that point. The probability distribution accounts for the spatial variations within and between each variable and accounts for the distance from bed measurements. I'll discuss this step in a lot more detail later in this talk. Next, we simulate a value by sampling from the probability distribution. Notice that we're not selecting the most likely bed value, which would give us a smooth bed. We're selecting this value randomly. Once we've simulated a value, it becomes part of the conditioning data and is treated like any other radar measurement. After that, each of these steps is repeated until every point has been simulated. Once the simulation is complete, we reverse the normal score transformation so that the original elevation distribution is recovered. And then we perform this process over and over to generate an ensemble of many realizations, which allows us to sample the uncertainty space. So let's go back and talk about how we get this posterior probability distribution. 
In order to combine multiple sources of spatially interdependent data, we use a geostatistical estimator known as co-creaking, which is a multivariate form of creaking. You've probably used creaking before, but as a quick recap, creaking predicts an unknown value by computing the weighted sum of other points. So imagine you have some hypothetical topography under the ice with three radar bed measurements and you want to predict the elevation at some unknown location. The optimal prediction will be some weighted average of these points. And, and these weights should account for redundancy between nearby points, proximity to the unknown point, and the variability of the topography. These weights are determined by the variogram, which describes the dissimilar dissimilarity between two points as a function of lag distance. So this curve says that as the lag distance between any two points increases, the expected variance increases. The variogram is directly related to the covariance function, which is a measure of similarity. Once you have the covariance function, you can set up a system of linear equations that allows you to solve for the weights, and then you can make your creaking prediction. The covariance function also allows you to estimate the variance at each point, so this is your uncertainty estimate. So Kriegen can be thought of as a form of linear regression where the weights are determined by prior covariances. In the case of co-Kriegen, we predict a point by computing the weighted sum of the data points from both variables. This means that the weights have to account for the spatial relationships within and between each variable. So we would need to calculate the variograms for both radar and mass conservation, as well as a cross variogram, which describes the variability between the two. So now we have two covariance functions and a cross covariance function. And I won't go into all the theoretical details, but this creates a very large and unstable system of equations that is difficult to solve. So in practice, no one solves the full co-creaking system. Instead, we need to use some sort of approximation. We use a Markov assumption of conditional independence to simplify the co-creaking system. So what does that mean? In probability theory, a Markov model is a stochastic model used to model randomly changing systems where it is assumed that future states depend only on the current state, not on the events that occurred before it. For example, if we have information about the current position and trajectory of a drone, then we can assume that the prediction of the future state is conditionally independent of the past state. Markov models are really common in the artificial intelligence community because they make complex decision-making problems much more tractable. So that's a Markov model in the time domain, but how do Markov models work in space? Well, in our case, there are two possible Markov assumptions we could make. The first option is that a mass conservation estimate at the same location as a radar measurement is independent of radar measurements at all other locations. We could also make the opposite assumption that an unknown radar measurement or real topography value at the same location as a mass conservation value is independent of all other mass conservation values. It's a bit confusing, but these assumptions are just saying that many of the data points can be thought of as conditionally independent of each other. So we can ignore a lot of, a lot of the data when we're modeling the covariation between the radar and mass conservation data sets. Each of these Markov models results in a different way of modeling the cross covariance function, or the function that describes the variability between the radar and mass conservation values. For Markov model one, the cross covariance is just a function of the primary variogram and the correlation coefficient between the two variables. And we don't need to model the variogram for the mass conservation topography. For Markov model two, we do need to model the secondary or mass conservation variogram because it determines the cross covariance function. And then the radar variogram or covariance function 
is a function of the mass conservation covariance in some residual term. So this is basically giving us a format for our covariance modeling. Markov model one is most commonly used because it doesn't require this extra variogram modeling. But we're going to test both models to see which one is better for this problem. So now we calculate the variograms. These are empirical variograms for the radar and mass conservation input parameters calculated along different directions. We can see that the radar has a higher variance than the mass conservation because it is rougher. We can also see some strong anisotropy because the topography is oriented along ice flow direction. We then fit variogram models to the empirical variograms according to the Markov model formulations. Here I'm showing the variograms modeled with Markov model two assumptions. These variograms account for anisotropy. We did this using the Stanford geostatistical modeling software which we also use to implement the simulations. So now that we have our variogram models, we're ready to simulate. These are zoomed in realizations using Markov models one and two. And we can see these glaring simulation artifacts in Markov model one. This is most likely because Markov model one can underestimate the redundancy between the primary and secondary variables. So it's causing the simulation to overcorrelate with the mass conservation topography. For this reason, we're going to use Markov model two from here on out. So if you were tuning out all the technical details on the geostatistics, now is a safe time to start listening. We generated an ensemble of 250 realizations using Markov model two. You can see that they retained the overall shape of the mass conservation topography, but with small scale variability. We then used the realizations to get an uncertainty estimate of the topography. We applied a simple water routing model to each realization in order to investigate the effect of topographic uncertainty on hydrologic uncertainty. Overall, each realization has a similar behavior, but in some of the realizations, not all the flow paths are terminating in the same location. So this might be useful if you're assessing the meltwater budget or interested in water piracy across catchment boundaries. This allows us to quantify uncertainty in flow path locations with respect to topographic uncertainty, which could provide very useful context when interpreting or planning geophysical surveys. I will also point out that many glaciers do not have such a dominant valley feature. So we can expect that the flow path uncertainty would be much higher in some other regions. So in summary, this method of stochastic simulation can enhance interpretations of subglacial hydrology and provides a path forward for quantifying hydrologic uncertainty. Thank you.